So hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm here today to talk about the truth about fundraising. Um, so just a little bit of background, first of all. So uh, today, I'm one of three partners that run a venture capital fund called NFX. Before that, uh, I was born in England, as you might guess from the accent. I moved to the US about 13 years ago. Founded an uh, online real estate company called Trulia, uh, which we merged with Zillow. Um, to create the world's largest online real estate marketplace. So my experience in fundraising is really the, the, the both sides of the table. So during my time at Trulia, we raised $33 million, principally backed by Axel Partners and then Sequoia Capital, as well as Angel, Angel Money. We raised a, a growth round and then took the company, company public in 2012, raising about 100 million. And then ultimately, a three and a half billion dollar merger with Zillow to create the largest online real estate company. So a little bit of background about NFX. So NFX is an early stage venture capital fund. We announced uh, the, the fund about four months ago. Really, there's, there's three key things you need to know. One is that the operational experience of the partners. So we're three partners. Collectively, we've founded about 10 companies that have exits of $10 billion. It's a very unique set of operating experience. We invested about 300 companies collectively in different markets and different sectors. We focus on early stage, seed stage investments. Two is that we, we kind of think that venture capital is kind of antiquated and we want to shake things up. We want to really do a better job both for founders as well as for our investors as well. And we're, part of the way we're doing that is infusing with technology. So we're software entrepreneurs at heart, and we're building software to help us to do a better job of what we're doing. And the third piece is that we are investing in network effect businesses. So NFX sounds for network effects. Um, network effects, as many of you know, is the property where the more people use a product, the better it gets for every other, product, every other user. So think of, obviously, Trulia, a real estate marketplace. Think of Airbnb. Think of Facebook. Think of platforms. Really, the property, the bigger the company gets, the better it gets. So the, just a thesis around that, why we, why we do that, we've looked back in time and realized that 70% of the value in technology has been created by companies that have network effects at their core. But only 20% of startups have network effects at their core. So that's our, that's our focus. And we're very deep in this, uh, in this thesis. So you can go to nfx.com and check out more about what we do. We have playbooks and, and identify 13 different types of network effects. Direct network effect, two-sided network effects, protocols, marketplaces, market networks. Really about providing defensibility for the company to help it survive and scale. So I'm going to talk next about seven truths about fundraising. Things that I've learned both as an as entrepreneur raising capital as well as, as, a, as an investor. So one, if you don't tell a VC you don't have competitors, you're communicating ignorance. <clears throat> so firstly, VCs look for big markets. And we, a VC is an outlier business. Getting huge exits is critically important. So if you're not attacking a big market, you, you, if you won't have competitors, so it's critical that you communicate that you have competitors. The views that investors look for are direct, adjacent, and potential. So understanding your competitors and identifying them, typically in the form of spreadsheet, what are your direct competitors, adjacent, and then potential competitors. And understanding in that spreadsheet around the strengths, weaknesses, funding, location, scale, what are the KPIs? Like being dismissive of your competitors is just an immediate rejection from investors. So understanding step by step who are your competitors, who are your potential competitors, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses, and most importantly is understanding what is your competitive edge. What is it you do uniquely that your competitors either cannot do or will not do? And your investors are going to ask this, and if you don't have an inside view and deep understanding of your competitors, then you're going to get rejected. 
And so I'd say great athletes know their competition, so do whatever you can to understand your competitors. That means phoning up for employees, that means going through their job, uh, job specs, speaking to uh, people that partner with that company, deeply understand your competition. So you've all seen these matrices. I personally prefer these as a way to understand, uh, understand competitors. So Airbnb and their original pitch decks, two axes. One is affordability, and the other is online transaction. Understanding how you fit into the competitive landscape and how difficult it is for other participants in that market to move into, uh, into the area that you look to define. For Trulia, this was our competitive matrix. We, we on the vertical axis was a great user experience. How do you provide incredible, easy to use consumer ex friendly experience? And on the right is a, on horizontal, is packing that full of content. And in, in our view, when we were pitching Trulia to the likes of Sequoia and Axel, uh, understanding what our competitors could not do to enable them to enter the competitive space that we looked to, to dominate. So two, nearly every successful fundraise is driven by scarcity. So it may be a surprise, but VCs are human too. And they, have a fear, they also have FOMO. They don't want to miss out on the incredible opportunities. And scarcity can be engineered by three key factors. Size of raise, confidence, and how quickly you move. And understanding the psychology of VCs beyond just having a great pitch is fundamental to success in fundraising. So firstly, fundraising is milestone-based. You may need $50 million to get to profitability. I, while, while people often say raise more than you can, the reality is to start lower. Set expectations. You can always increase the amount you raise, but you can very, very hard to pull back and lower that amount. Manufacture what you want by confident articulation. Confidence is key. Confidence is fundamental to your success. And confidence comes from domain knowledge. So understanding deeply about your market, understanding deeply about your competitors, understanding deeply about your unit economics. Confidence comes from practice. Investors love confidence. And they expect, when you're pitching, you to have that confidence. So third, speed is, uh, speed is critical. So when pitching investors, speed is against you. Investors want to drag the process out. So investors, time is their friend. Investors say, well, if I wait three months, I'm going to get more data around how a company is doing. I'm going to get more insights. I'm going to do more diligence. I'm going to track competitors. But fundamentally, you need to move fast, because as a startup, Speed is often your greatest asset. So moving fast, creating a sense of scarcity, confidence, managing the process, is fundamental to your success. And ultimately, the deal is not done until the money hits the bank. So, so frequently, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, many, many founders uh, get term sheets, but don't close the transaction for a variety of reasons. Fundamentally, it's about getting the money in the bank, and don't let down, and don't slow down until that's done. So understanding the psychology of investors and the behavior, how you act, is fundamentally critical for your success. So three, your network is the power of your hunger. So I moved to the US uh, in 2013, and I didn't know anyone when I moved to the US. Literally, I didn't know anyone. Uh, and I was fortunate to go to a good grad school, so I managed to tap into that network there. And the reality is very few people are born connected. They're just hungry. I networked my way through to investors, through to my business partner, through to early employees. And this is a skill that you have to develop. It's not, if it's not a skill that's innate with you, that's fine. But maybe being a founder is not the right role for you. And, and VCs know this. They look you, they look, they, identify, they look for skills and traits for you that, that demonstrate your ability to network and scale and ultimately raise money. A key, uh, a key principle around networking 
uh, really evangelized by Brad Feld is give first. If you're networking and looking for to take, you're unlikely to be successful. Fundamentally, fundraising and networking is about giving. How can you connect with others and give them something first, and then you'll receive. Uh, and critically important, your network drives warm introductions, drives closure. Raising money through cold emails doesn't work. I get hundreds of cold emails a week. It's very, very hard for me to filter that through. When I get emails from warm introductions, people that I know, people that I work with, people I went to university with, I'm going to give that a second look. You're wasting your time nine times out of 10 if you're making cold, if you're sending cold emails to entrepreneurs. And then FX uh, is trying to help to solve this problem by we launch your own tool called Signal, DonFX, which facilitates warm introductions. This is a completely free piece of software available to any entrepreneur to connect with over 6,000 investors. Just to give you a sort of example around this, so this is my, uh, my partner, James. And the nature of this tool, it plugs into your Gmail and helps you identify who can give you the warmest introduction to James. So Amy or Millie or Kevin can make that introduction to James. So understanding way, way more advanced than, say, LinkedIn, who can make the warmest introduction to people. So we have 6,000 profiles. You can search uh, by different characteristic, name, sector, location. Uh, and then if there's investors that are not on the platform, you encourage them to add uh, add their profile to the platform. So signal.nfx.com. So four, just like a startup, optimizing for the long term is critical. You need to hit short-term goals, whether that's metrics or that milestones or fundraising, but fundamentally it's about long term. And the founders that are able to do this, the founders that can figure out what is the uh, the founders that can execute and hit uh, their long-term goals and uh, hit focus on the long-term are more likely to be successful. Uh, so by way of example, um, so I met, I pitched Sequoia before Trulia launched uh, back in around 2005. And they turned us down. And we went and raised angel financing. I pitched them again uh, for the first institutional round. They turned us down again. And then about two years after we launched, I saw them again. Uh, and this time, they invested, although at about 10x increase in valuation from, from what I did originally. And you know, not only did I think we have, a, we have a good business, but critically, we, I said to them at the partner meeting, uh, you know, I pitched you guys two years ago. Go back and look at the deck that I presented and see how we compared to what we said we were going to do. And we did everything we said we'd do, and a few more things as well. And you know, that's the biggest validation, I think, that we had at that time, that we said we were going to do something. We delivered on a promise. Ultimately, we hit our plan. Um, and investors look for that. Many of the great investors, you'll meet them early on. You'll tell them what you're going to do. And if you deliver on that promise, they're so much more likely to invest in you. And trust is like traction. Trust is very, very hard to earn. But once you have it, it's hugely important. And trust is about how you interact with investors, how you deliver on your promises. And once you have it, clearly like traction, the benefits are enormous. And again, thinking about the long term, the, the fundamental success is often about not optimizing for, for valuation, but it's really about what are the right terms that you can structure. You see so many companies that have tried to have massive unicorn valuations for the benefit of PR, and then it's coming back to haunt many of them. So simple terms uh, drives uh, simplicity in terms, helps to, to manage future fundraising, makes it much easier for you in the long term. So five, what do they say? Timing is everything. 
And the formula for yes is a combination of market timing, product timing, and company timing. So, and we, so we all think of venture capitalists being comfortable with risk. The reality is they're not. They want to have the least risky investment with the highest possible return. So the combination of three things, is it the right time to invest in this market? Is it the right time to invest in this product? And is it the right time to invest in this company? If those three things are true, then you're much, much more likely to raise capital. So I think of this as a three-factor tipping point. So firstly, market timing. So you see in certain industries, nothing happens, and then suddenly some magic happens that makes that a suddenly a fascinating industry to invest in. Think automotive. Like, how much innovation has there been in transportation in the last 100 years? Not that much, except in the last 10 years. Massive amounts of innovation. Similarly, what is the product timing? So investors will look, OK, this is an interesting market, but is this company and this product focused on the most interesting technology or solution around that? So you know, the, the sort of interesting technology today, obviously things like blockchain and AI and augmented reality, synthetic biology, et cetera, these are new, exciting technologies, the most exciting part of the market or often the most exciting part of the ecosystem or distribution. Is this the fastest and most exciting part of the market? And if you're not, then you should revisit what you're doing. Third, company timing. Investors are focused at different stages. Some are focused at seed stage, some are focused at growth stage. What's the right fit for them? So, uh, and this is often thought of as traction. What is the traction? Do they have scale? at this particular phase? And have you proven enough for that right stage of investing? So if you're focused on Series A, have you got revenue and product market fit? If you're focused at growth stage, do you have really compelling unit economics and you want to scale? So is the company timing right for the investor? So six, having too many VC meetings can be as bad as having none. So the reality about venture capital is that it's a pretty small community. Investors collaborate with other investors that work together on a particular deal. And you know, I think this is, this is the way it is. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a small world where, where word travels fast. And a lot of collaboration is done between these investors. And so if you're, and if you're fundraising, clearly if you're meeting with no one, it's a, it's a problem. If you're clearly meeting with everyone and you're trying to sort of scatter yourself, trying to connect with thousands or hundreds of investors, you're not going to be successful because you're not able to dedicate the time to understand what is that investor really focused on and how you can communicate and convince them. So this is really about finding a small number of investors that are a sweet spot for what you're trying to achieve as a company and what that investor is trying to achieve in the investments that they're going to make. So we launched a tool, well, sorry, we're going to launch a tool uh, in the next couple of weeks called VC Match, trying to help this solve, solve this problem. Built off the same database of investor profiles, 6,500 investors. This is another free tool for, uh, for founders to use to connect with, with prospective investors. Help to make recommendation investors that may be a fit with what they're focused on. So we're, we're opening up beta access to this. So sign up at vcmatchapp.com. Uh, register there, and you can have access to this as soon as it launches. And then finally, seven, if you treat VCs like a check, then that's all you're going to get. So one of the, the observations you hear from probably many investors like and many entrepreneurs like, my investors aren't giving me anything, they're just giving me money. I think the reality is different. If you're a founder that goes into this relationship just looking for money, unfortunately, that's basically what you're going to get. But if you're going into this relationship looking, well, this is an individual, this is a fund that deeply understands my sector, has domain experience, investment experience, has demonstrated passion for this and expertise, 
you're way more likely to get much more than just money. And this perception that you have, which is focused on how can I build a long-term relationship with investor, um, is, a, is very much a two-way street. They will look at you and say, well, this is an interesting founder that I can work with to help to, uh, that I can help, that I can advise. And, and they're going to be way more interested in working with you because they can feel this is a relationship which, which they can contribute and you can benefit in a way that's way more than money. And this is a, uh, this is a relationship built on personality uh, based on skills. There's thousands and thousands of investors out there. But the ones that you have a great close working relationship with are going to be ultimately way more fruitful in the good times and bad. And ultimately, the, the investor syndicate is critical to your company brand. You know, I think for when I was raising capital, having some uh, highly sought after and interesting angel investors and seed investors was hugely beneficial for me when it came to raise institutional capital. And this is a phrase, a good company keeps good company, but the more you can build relationships with investors that have a shared passion, interest in what you're doing, the more you'll be successful in raising future money. So, uh, so this is, as I said, I, cold emails are bad, but in the spirit of openness, um, here's my email address. <coughs> um, and uh, Twitter for myself and NFS Guild as well. I don't know if we have time for questions, but do we have five minutes for questions. It was a very good presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to know that what do you know right now you wished you knew when you started your career? So what did I know right now that I wish I knew when I started? Um, what do I wish I knew? I mean, where do you start? Um, uh, so I think, the, um, I think that I could answer that question in many ways. I think some of the... the, the on the fundraising side of things, I think there is a. Uh, no, I'm going to I'm going to flip the question around. I think if I actually if I actually knew everything that I did at the end of it, I would never have started a company. Because <laughs> it's frigging hard. Um, this is incredibly hard. So actually, <laughs> so if I if I knew everything, I would have like. Probably that's a really bad idea. I would never do that. Um, and that, in a way, is like the reality of entrepreneurship in that the, the, it's often that um, optimistic, naive outsider that's looking in industry and says, well, I think there's a better way. And it is illogical and irrational to start a startup quite often. And so you need that kind of irrational optimism to be successful. So, you know, I like naive, you know, naivety is a good thing. So... There's lots of execution things, but the high level, I think, being naive and optimistic is critical. Oh, so many questions. There was actually him before, sorry. Hello, uh, why did you select to move to US instead to stay in Europe? What's, what's better in US for fundraising or networking? I don't know. Uh, so fundamentally, um, and the, there's US and there's the Bay Area, but for, for me, there is a... <laughs> so, so, so there's, uh, so the fundamentally it's about network effects and fun, it's about the ecosystem and so, and the ecosystem in Silicon Valley is like unbelievably unique um, and so, and that ecosystem and that network effect is enormously beneficial um, when raising capital. It's a combination of talent, money and culture which is which is un unbeatable. I think the UK is interesting, or, or Europe is interesting, but you know, reality is that most of the enormous companies are actually started and run out of Silicon Valley. Pete, I wanted to find out, when, it, when you talked about competitive edge, I'm kind of always curious how VCs pick, for example, someone like Trulli and, Z and Zillow when they were 
competing against each other, or Lyft versus Uber. So in that type of competitive, what would define a competitive edge between the companies that have similar models? Well, I would say that, I mean, Lyft and Uber have become almost identical, um, except for the brand. Um, but in the early days, that wasn't the case. Um, and so you can make arguments kind of pro and for about them. I think the kind of reality is that in these enormous markets, you can have multiple significant competitors. But uh, in the early days, it's just, um, it was unclear who was going to be successful, Uber or, or, or Lyft. And, they, and, you know, and they're both going to be mm -hmm. enormously successful. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Who? Oh. There was him before, I remember. Thank you. Um, Alex, founder of Athenosphere. I know that your background is actually very different from real estate. You're actually physics and materials. How did you get into real estate in the first place? Uh, so, so, I moved to the, so the, I moved to the US, uh, like I said, for grad school. And the, um, you know, I was kind of shocked at Silicon Valley. There was no access to information. And around real estate, I was trying to find somewhere to live. And I thought this was a kind of meaningful problem. And you, you look at real estate, and it's like, this enormous market that everyone needs that is kind of dysfunctional back in, back in the US. So certainly the research process back in 2005. So that was, it's more about how can you have a meaningful impact in the world? And for me, doing that across housing was the most interesting. So I think we're out of time, but thanks everyone. Thank you. Good day, have a good day. Thanks.